Okay, I think we're ready to start. Does that sound good to you, Morgan? Okay, All right, yes, person. sounds good, go ahead. Okay, uh, so welcome everyone to the November CIS case conference. We're coming to you from Canada. Uh, Nikki is currently in uh, Calgary and I'm in a cabin in Kimberley, BC in the Rockies where it's snowing and uh, beautiful. So I hope that, um, that the weather is good wherever you are. It's probably much warmer than it is here. So we have a couple of cases. I, I see patients who have adult uh, or adult patients of immune deficiencies and uh, Nikki sees uh, pediatric patients. So we'll be presenting both sides tonight. And uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, so feel free to ask questions. We've got our, our little chat uh, section on there. And I think we both have places in our presentations where we'll be asking you for uh, differentials or um, even just input and, and uh, comments. Uh, so my presentation is uh, called Quality versus Quantity, Challenges in the Management of the Adult PID Patient. So this is a 34-year-old female who was referred to me in September of 2017. She'd previously been cared for in Edmonton and, uh, and then uh, decided to move to Calgary. She was generally well as a child, um, had a few ear infections, an episode of shingles before the age of 10, but no hospitalizations for infections, didn't need any IV antibiotics. In her teen years is when things started to change. And she actually initiated intravenous immune globulin therapy at the age of 16. Um, I'll just kind of go through her issues by system. And uh, so at the age of 14, she was hospitalized with severe diarrhea. Initially, it was diagnosed with Crohn's, Crohn's disease, uh, then colitis, and then they called it autoimmune enteropathy in the end. She did receive some treatment with Imuran and prednisone, but hasn't been on any immunomodulatory agents since 2011. Uh, she was last scoped in February 2017. Her on her scope, there was no plasma cells and no goblet cells throughout her GI tract. She did have increased inflammatory cells in the lamina propria and intraepithelial lymphocytosis, though. In the last few years, issues with ongoing diarrhea three to ten times a day. She occasionally has some urgency. She has had fecal incontinence and some intermittent nausea that's kind of ongoing. She's, of course, followed by gastroenterology, and they're working with her on this. And Entercourt has made some difference for her. From a hematology point of view, things have been quite active as well. So she has a history of autoimmune hemolytic anemia in 2002, 2005, 2014, and 2018. She's responded nicely to steroid uh, and rituximab. The most recent episode, which I treated, we initially had things under control with steroid, but then as she started tapering, she started to relapse. And so I gave her some rituxin and that worked nicely for her. Um, she had ITP in 2010, treated with IVIG. And then an autoimmune neutropenia that was first diagnosed in March 2015, and someone had started her on some GCSF. And so when I saw her in 2017, she was still on these injections, and and, uh, and we stopped those, and, and her neutrophils have been have been fine. Uh, previous iron and B12 deficiency. She has a mild, uh, mildly enlarged spleen. It measured about 13.5 to 13.8 centimeters in 2016 and 2019, and some very mild hilar adenopathy, uh, just about 1.2 centimeters. In terms of infections, this is kind of a short list of her infections. From a viral perspective, she's had shingles several times, uh, 2002, 2009, and then a disseminated episode in 2011. Uh, she had HSV uh, that actually affected her eye, and she did require a corneal transplant. Uh, she had warts up until about 2016. She hasn't had any since I've known her. From a bacterial point of view, uh, she grows serratia, pseudomonas almost every time she's uh, she's a BAL or or um, does a sputum culture. More excella. She's also grown M MSSA. She has sinus infections, um, otitis, and uh, to the point where she's had hearing loss. And then she's had several rounds of C diff, so 2014, 18, and 19. She grows macular sputum. Um, most recently cultured in 2016, but they think it's sort of always there. And then from a fungal point of view, she grew Aspergillus versicolor on a BAL in 2016. She typically will get some thrush when she's on inhaled steroid or systemic steroid, and then a few vaginal yeast infections as well. From a pulmonary point of view, um, she recently had a CT done in March, and uh, that showed extensive bronchiectasis, which was known, um, and it's the both lung bases as well as the right middle lobe and the lingula. She has bronchial wall thickening and mucus plugging. Uh, this CT was actually stable from previous, and I think her one prior to that was in 2017. 
She has uh, a decreased FEV1 at 38% of predicted, and in 2017, it was 48%. And in, her FVC has also decreased over the last couple of years uh, slightly. She had a cardiopulmonary exercise test done uh, within the last year that showed, showed a mildly reduced uh, peak VO2. Uh, it was about 76% of predicted. She's got a normal echo and no evidence of pulmonary hypertension. She makes about 80 mils of sputum per day when she's well. And she does play the trumpet and she uses this for airway clearance. From a social and family history, she's a high school music teacher. I don't know what it is. I don't know if anybody else has this problem, but it seems like a lot of my, my patients who have immune deficiencies like to be in, in careers that involve um, being with children. And uh, I try to encourage them to do other things, but they don't seem to listen. So she's really passionate about music and enjoys, enjoys teaching high school music. Um, she does not use any alcohol, uh, does not use drugs, and is a lifelong non-smoker. And there's no family history of any immune deficiencies, lymphoma, anything like that. She has uh, two healthy siblings. In terms of her testing, so when I initially saw her, I sent her off for uh, some immune, um, immune deficiency testing by flow cytometry. I found she has no B cells, uh, specifically no memory or naive B cells. She has normal total, well, almost normal total T cells, almost normal CD4 cells, and uh, similarly, the CD8s are just slightly low, and slightly low NK cells. From a functional point of view, she, does, she does, uh, doesn't really make immunoglobulin well, so that IgG you see there is within, the, within our normal reference range, but that's her replaced value. I actually couldn't go far back enough in the records to know what her baseline level was when she was 16. IgA is undetectable, and her IgM is actually within uh, normal at 0.61. I didn't test uh, vaccine responses as she is on replacement. Uh, mitogens, she did have good T cell function with normal responses to PHA, poquid mitogen, and conate. And I tested CF in her just because, uh, just given her history of bronchiectasis and the types of bugs she was growing, uh, but she had a negative sweat chloride and genetics. Any thoughts on the diagnosis? So what would, what, I'm curious to know what people at other centers would do from here, whether people um, with their adult patients, when they see a patient in their 30s, if they do jump to do genetics at this point, or if they just sort of treat these people as uh, assumed kind of CVID. This is what I hear someone saying, is it SCID, monogenic variant of CVID or CVID itself? Um, question added. Okay, I'm going to see if I can figure out how to look at this. Oh, I can't see the question. GATA2 is another option that's coming up here. So I, I go ahead and do genetics. And again, I'm, I'm curious to know what others, other people's practices are. Uh, but typically in my patients that have, uh, you know, kind of complicated histories like this, yeah, Tamara Rubin is saying genetics. Um, I typically go to that. And uh, so that's what we did. We use up, at, up here, we use a blueprint um, genetics. Morgan, I'm seeing on my screen that there's questions being added, but I can't see the questions. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, if you could just um, put them up in the in the left-hand corner, there's a little um, button that says attendee chat. If you could put your questions there, we would really appreciate it. Yeah, for some reason when it just pops up, it doesn't actually show me the question. Uh, yeah, so Blueprint, we find, has a really good panel, and it's economical, so our genetics department likes it. And uh, so we did that and found she has a heterozygous mutation in NF-kappa B1. Um, were the labs done after rituximab? No, those were actually pre-rituxed. She hadn't received rituxed in several years uh, prior, to, prior to those labs being done. Uh, so yeah, so that that B cell flow, either you're right, could have potentially meant that she didn't reconstitute post rituximab, or or that she indeed has no uh, no B cells. Um, so yeah, so we found this heterozygous mutation in NF kappa B1 with the following uh, genetics listed below. So uh, NF kappa B1 mutations are common, supposedly in CVID. Uh, they were first described by Dr. I think it was Dr. Grimbacher's group back in 2015, where he described three families. And, uh, and since then, there have been a few other case reports over the years. The most recent study, which was published in 2018 in, in Jackie, showed a cohort of 846 patients with, with CVID, autoimmunity, or recurrent infections suggestive for severely defective innate or cell-mediated immunity. Uh, they looked at this from this 
uh, NIHR Bioresource Rare Diseases Database. And of, uh, of 390 patients that were identified with CVID, 16 had loss of function variants in NF-kappa B1. So that number to about 4.1%. Um, so indeed, that is felt to be very common in the CVID world. Uh, and it's a basically autosomal dominant haploinsufficiency. It's interesting because the very uh, penetrance of this is quite uh, variable. And uh, so they did some look at families and found that that even there were some asymptomatic carriers and, uh, of course, um, disease uh, presenting at various ages. This was uh, a list of the genes that they identified in that study I just mentioned. And the one that I've highlighted there is the one that my patient has. Um, so high probability of being pathogenic. Um, NF-kappa B1 encodes the P105 protein, which is processed to produce the DNA binding P50 subunit. And as I said, these 16 mutations that were identified are all located in the N-terminal P50 part of that protein. Uh, they're associated with reduced protein levels in the 12 mutations where that was, was studied. This is just a list of the mutations that they found and gives a bit of an idea of what kind of uh, phenotype we see with this, with the NF-kappa B1 mutations. So universally, the patients have infections. Several of them, the vast majority, have autoimmunity. And then some also have malignancy. I've highlighted the one that my patient has there, so not uh, no reports of malignancy in that so far, but, um, but it is a frame shift mutation, and, uh, and um, um, I guess we'll see going forward kind of what happens to her. The phenotype, basically a recurrent sinopulmonary infections, as we all know, very characteristic of CVID and uh, typically encapsulated organisms, but certainly not always. Some patients have had issues with viral infections, specifically herpetic infections. Uh, lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly uh, are common. And autoimmune disease is another characteristic. Uh, cytopenias, as I discussed with my patients, enteropathy, colitis, thyroid problems, uh, liver issues. There's some question about whether these are autoimmune in nature. And then 29% had uh, malignancy. Four of those had lymphoma. And one person had breast and one person had a, a parathyroid adenoma. The age of presentation is quite variable, um, so anywhere from 2 to 64 years of age. And this is just uh, from their supplementary material in that article where they actually uh, gave the, um, I guess, sort of more information about, about how that one patient with the same um, genetic defect as mine presented and, and sounds very similar to me. Um, so respiratory infections with bronchiectasis, chronic diarrhea, lots of pseudomonas, staph aureus, um, they talked about this, their patient having, having uh, RSV, as well as atypical MAC, C. difficile, planter's warts, um, zoster, so something that my patients had kind of intermittently, but not, um, not ongoing. And, um, and then they also talked about kind of the Evans syndrome, autoimmune enteropathy, and vitamin B12 deficiency, which I also suspected was pernicious anemia. So this sounds pretty much like a copy of, uh, of the patient that I'm seeing. In terms of immunophenotype, um, these patients typically have low memory class switched B cells, uh, reduced IgG and reduced B cell proliferation, often have normal T cell numbers and proliferation. Other groups have reported slightly different things. So one group reported T cell dysfunction with associated EBV infection. Uh, another group reported postoperative inflammatory problems like these necrotizing infections. And also Bechet's like disease has also been mentioned in this in NF-kappa B1. From my patient's point of view, um, she has, from a physical uh, perspective, deteriorating lung function. Uh, her bronchiectasis is severe. She's having frequent exacerbations, needing about 10 to 12 courses of antibiotics annually, um, and that's increasing over time. She's needing more IV antibiotics, kind of in spite of, of uh, me trying to optimize her immunoglobulin replacement and running her at slightly higher levels. From a functional perspective, she can walk up about two flights of stairs. Um, she's currently managed with Symbacorts, Viriva, Combavent, and Ventolin as needed. She uses nebulized uh, tobramycin, alternating with colistin every four weeks. Uh, they have her using hypertonic saline daily with physio, and she's supposed to be doing twice daily chest physio. There's some question amongst my colleagues in pulmonary medicine about how much she, she is compliant with these interventions. Um, I think my patient has her has some ideas around kind of what she needs to do for herself and what works for her, and I'm not sure it's totally in line with what the, the lung docs would like her to be doing. 
she was referred to our lung transplant group in April 2019, and uh, they I, I've spoken to them. They have some concerns about transplanting her, just given what would the effect of immunosuppression be uh, on her? Would this make infections worse? Uh, you know, how would this affect her her GI tract? Um, what would happen with her cytopenias? I guess there can be some uh, damage to the vagus nerve, and they were worried about you know would this affect her motility more and, and just a lot of unanswered questions just given the complexity of the patient. And they really felt that it was too early for her to um, uh, receive a transplant or be listed for transplant and were quite um, um, steadfast in saying she really needed to optimize and maximize other therapies first. Um, from the patient's perspective, she she's finding things very difficult. So she has expressed to me a few times that she feels like physicians are giving up on her. A few years ago, she could run, and she feels like the medical system is not trying hard enough to turn things around for her. Uh, she wants to get back to this. I think it was around, I want to say it was around 2015 or 2016 when she when she was feeling quite well, and things have just really deteriorated since then. And uh, And she seems to feel some of that is external to her, which it may well be. As I mentioned previously, the pulmonary docs don't really think she's doing enough and, and that she could be doing more to try to maintain the current lung function that she has. Um, she describes her quality of life as poor and doesn't really want to keep living like this. She's had some passive suicidal ideation. Um, quality is very important to her over quantity. And uh, I think she feels quite isolated. Like she's she's talked about, you know, who wants to be with someone who coughs all the time. Um, she's not in a relationship because you know, she hasn't even, doesn't even kind of venture out to try dating because she just feels like no one would, would want to, to, she would be a burden to a partner and no one would want, would want to be with her. Um, she's very aware of all that she's lost and, uh, or never had as a result of her illness. Um, she loved teaching and, and she's now finding that it's, it's getting really hard to find a job. Um, and, uh, she currently isn't working, uh, simply because she is so, um, is ill so frequently. So what to do? So um, I wondered in this case, and I see some people are seeing the saying the same thing on the side here, uh, just about do we do a combined lung transplant uh, and uh, or rather sequential lung transplant and aloe uh, stem cell transplant, um, uh, perhaps with the Pittsburgh group versus just doing a, a lung transplant alone. Um, I, I've, my only other experience with this type of scenario was with a patient that actually has an NF-kappa B2 defect and he had um, PSC and we actually did a liver transplant on him. He did not have nearly the same degree of comorbidity that this patient, current patient has. Um, and so he he's actually done really well just with a plain old liver transplant and, and is maintaining his graft. We're still on IVIG doing actually back to work doing extremely well. Um, this patient I don't I don't think would bounce back quite the same way. And uh, I did reach out to the Pittsburgh group just to, um, well, actually I talked to Dr. Grimbacher because he kind of published on these patients and just to get his thoughts on how what the best way to manage her would be. And he, he kind of thought what I suspected, which was that sequential transplant might be optimal for her. And um, so I did reach out to the group in Pittsburgh and they were, were interested. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to ask them was kind of what their parameters were for indications for transplant, just to see if they were doing it any earlier than our group was here. And, and that the message I was getting was that it was quite similar to what our transplant group was saying, and that she might be a bit early even for that. But it's something we are exploring, and it's something I've discussed with the patient, uh, just as an option going forward, just to optimize things long term for her. Um, and then the question, of course, becomes uh, when to do it. Oh, sorry, Luciano asked a question about what is the experience in an NF-CAF B1 patients in BMT. So I have not been able to find anyone who has done this. Um, if anyone knows of anyone, please please tell me. Uh, but the Pittsburgh group hasn't transplanted one of these patients. And I don't think Dr. Grimbacher has either. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I don't, I don't think he has. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any experience with transplanting this group, I'd be very keen to, to chat with you. Um, and as I said, when, you know, kind of when to do this, she, she very much sees waiting for transplant as just waiting for herself to deteriorate and watch herself get, get worse. Um, and she'd rather have a transplant earlier knowing that she may not live as long, but, uh, she'd rather experience improved quality of life for even a short time. Uh, pulmonary sees how things could be worse post-transplant and have significant concerns regarding morbi morbidity uh, post-transplant, giving her complexity. And so I think it's really a matter of people looking at the issue through different uh, different lenses. And I don't know that there's kind of a right or a wrong um, answer in this case. 
So that's that's my case. If anyone has any questions, comments, or ideas, I'm certainly open open to um, hearing them. It's um, I mean I don't think her prognosis is is good long term. I worry about what else might come her way the longer we wait to intervene um, in terms of malignancy or you know a serious infection that could take her life. Um, but uh, but it's yeah I mean my hands are a bit tied just given that we're kind of dependent on the on the lung uh, lung transplant and my understanding from the sequential point of view is that they typically do the organ transplant first and then the the stem cell transplant uh, later. Okay, so if there are no no questions or comments, I will pass it over to Nikki to uh, present her her case. Great case, Jen. That was uh, a good example of some of the fun adults you have to look after. So I'm gonna present a case of an unexpected diagnosis in a child with thrombocytopenia and bone marrow failure. Uh, so this is a patient I initially saw several years ago, and uh, she was a little bit of a surprise once we actually figured out what was going on. So he was a term uh, Caucasian boy who presented at 11 months of age with long-standing failure to thrive and short stature. When I first met him, his height and weight were under the 0.1 percentile, so he was very small. Uh, he was breastfeeding and eating solids by that point with no food restrictions, and the family had met with a dietitian and a pediatrician, and they were trying high calorie and high fat diet. He didn't have any GI symptoms at that time, so no vomiting, uh, no diarrhea. He didn't have constipation. There was no history of blood in his stools. Uh, he had one soft heart bowel movement daily. He did have moderate to severe eczema, and that was treated with high potency topical steroids. Uh, he'd be, his rash intermittently would be weeping, and he would be treated with topical antibiotics with good effect. Uh, and on one of his visits with the dermatologist, uh, she noted that he had petechiae and bruising. So sent him for a CBC, and his platelets came back at 41, uh, hence the referral to me. Uh, and of course, not surprisingly, this was an urgent referral. Um, and on the history, there was no bleeding. It was just the petechiae and bruising. So on my clinical history, uh, he had a history of bronchiolitis at seven months of age, for which he did have a visit to the eMERGE, but did not require admission to hospital. He had one episode of otitis media at eight months that was draining, uh, and somebody actually cultured it. Uh, it grew group A strep and responded well to antibiotics. He had a possible cellulitis of the penis scrotum upper thigh area, that responded well to oral antibiotics. Otherwise, he didn't have any other infections, no thrush, no diaper rash, no delayed umbil umbilical cord separation. Uh, he had normal development. Uh, pregnancy was complicated by gestational diabetes that was diet controlled, but was otherwise normal. The only medications he had been on was his vitamin D and his topical uh, steroids and the mupiracin. He had no known allergies, and his immunizations were up to date to six months when I first saw him. In family history, he had a healthy older sister who had asthma and nut allergies. There was a maternal male first cousin with celiac disease and eosinophilic esophagitis. There was a maternal uncle that died of nine months of age from chronic diarrhea that was apparently secondary to toxoplasmosis. There's a maternal grandmother with uh, atopy, a grandfather with pancreatitis. There was thyroid disease in grandmothers on both sides, and also a paternal grandfather who died of bone cancer at 47 years of age. Uh, and we didn't get any more history than that from the family. When I saw him, uh, he was very small. So at 11 months of age, he was 6.26 kilograms uh, and 64.6 .6 centimeters. Uh, he was non-dysmorphic. Uh, he had two teeth coming in that were normal. He had allergic shiners, mild to moderate eczema at that time throughout his body uh, with quite a lot of excoriations behind his ears and on his hands. His fingernails were pitted and ridged. He didn't have any anopia or pavis fundamentally, and the remainder of the exam was completely normal. And his CBC that he walked in the door with was a hemoglobin of 108. So 10.8 for the Americans joining us. 
uh, platelets were 41, white count was normal, neutrophils and lymphocytes were both normal, and his eosinophils were high at 1.1. Uh, so I will stop here and ask uh, for differential diagnosis. I have one that says Schwachmann diamond, which is certainly what we're definitely thinking about. Um, next uh, suggestion was with Scott Aldridge, which, uh, yes, there were alarm bells going off in my brain. Um, and then a question, you're going to have to tell us platelet size. Oh, I'm keeping that well-kept secret. Um, with Scott Aldridge, particularly with the maternal uncle being affected, uh, and that's what I have for comments so far. Um, and if it was that easy, um, I wouldn't be presenting this case. <laughs> so our other investigations, um, oh, we got, we, now we have some more interesting things coming through. Card 11, <laughs> Doc 8. Um, so flow cytometry for what Scott Aldridge we sent off right away, and uh, it was normal. And his platelets, when I did review his smear, uh, were not small. His MPV was actually normal. Um, we did do an immune workup because when he walked through the door, I was, of course, thinking of what's got. Um, and his immunoglobulins, IgG, M, and A were all normal. Those are all the Canadian SI units that are normal. His IgE was quite elevated, uh, so 3,511. And I have had some joke syndrome, uh, hey, right, GE in here um, as on the differential. He had a good response to diphtheria and tetanus. Lymphocyte subsets were all normal, um, including his naive cells and his mitogens to PHA, conconavulin A, and pokeweed mitogen were normal. So really the only things we had were low platelets, uh, his high acidophils, high IgE, and then he was failure to thrive in short. Um, so yes, the, some other people have suggested stat one gain of function. T rigs, uh, double negative T cells, um, IPEX. So, yes, uh, this is TH17. Uh, this is def all definitely things on the differential. So, we continue to investigate him. Um, at that time, I don't think our lab actually had uh, some of the other testing available, but I'll tell you how the story unfolded. Um, we looked at his platelet retics because I was wondering if this was ITP versus a marrow problem. And his platelet retics were actually quite low at 1.7% with an absolute 0.2. Um, and his platelet count continued to drop over the next few months uh, to less than 10. His hemoglobin was dropping um, and he also was developing some mild anemia. So I had on the differential also a marrow failure syndrome. So we did a bone marrow aspirin biopsy, and this found a moderate decreased megakaryocytes. Uh, cellularity was 70%, which is a little bit low for a child this age. Um, there's expansion of hematogones and a normal karyotype. Thinking that this could possibly be ITP, uh, we did try IVIG, which didn't do anything for his platelets. We also did a platelet transfusion. He had some mucosal bleeding and at one point needed the platelet transfusion and had an excellent response to it. So it was not a consumption problem. We were still thinking about with Scott Aldridge, so went ahead and sequenced the gene, especially knowing that flow cytometry uh, doesn't pick up all mutations, but that was normal. Um, bone marrow failure, uh, we were looking at, we did the next generation sequencing panel for that, and that was normal. And we also looked for infections, that was all normal. Um, and I have a, a few other people who are throwing out uh, with a couple of other suggestions for things on the differential diagnosis. So as he progressed, um, at this point in time, I would have loved to do further genetic testing, but we didn't have any clinical funding to do much more. Uh, and in particular, I wanted an exome. Um, so my hands were, it was a little bit challenging. Um, with the concern about marrow failure, we did try him on El Trombopeg, um, but he didn't have a response and it wasn't tolerated. His iron studies increased very significantly and his bilirubin and liver enzymes also went up. He was quite unwell on the on El Trombopeg. He had this yellowish hue to himself and was very fatigued uh, and that resolved when he came off of it. Um, we also switched him to Romiplasm after that and he had no response to that either, though he didn't have a complete trial of Romiplasm. When we took him off the L-trombopig, his transaminitis persisted, uh, and workup for that was unremarkable. Um, so no infections were found, no uh, autoimmunity, metabolic workup was negative, though we weren't able to do a biopsy 
uh, that was challenging as he played the transfusion and, and also very small. Um, and his transaminitis wasn't um, significantly, um, it wasn't, like it was kind of in the hundreds. So GI wasn't super concerned about it, doing a biopsy and was just following. Then at 17 months of age, he developed some diarrhea. Uh, his, it was non-bloody and his abdomen became quite protuberant at times. Um, he saw an allergist and was diagnosed with multiple food allergies. Uh, an infectious workup for his diarrhea was negative. CLAC screen was negative. Fecal last days was normal. His sweat fluoride was normal. Uh, and he was seen by GI, but things seemed to get better after five or six months. So the investigations didn't go any further. Um, he was then admitted to the hospital for influenza A and a likely bacterial pneumonia at 22 months of age and required oxygen for, during that admission. Dropped his hemoglobin uh, with that admission and required a red blood cell transfusion. And he was admitted two years of age with adenovirus gastroenteritis uh, and ended up in the PICU with severe enteropathy and difficulty managing fluid and electrolytes. Uh, he was NPO and TPN dependent. Uh, the GI doc who was managing him said to me, I've never seen a child die from diarrhea, but this kid, kid might. Uh, it was uh, extremely difficult to keep his electrolytes and fluids up because he was just pouring out water, even though he was NPO. His platelets at that time uh, were less than 10. Uh, he was anemic and requiring intermittent red blood cells, and he continued to have mild elevation of his liver enzymes. So with a lack of clinical funding for uh, whole exome sequencing, I begged and pleaded with a number of my friends and thankfully uh, Baylor agreed to do it on a research basis. And uh, just, I think within a week or two of him and being admitted to the hospital, the exome sequencing returned. Um, and I will give you the diagnosis. I've had some other suggestions like STAT 5B, which especially the short, short stature was definitely in our differential. Um, but that was not what it was. Uh, a few people got this earlier than I did. <laughs> uh, it was IPEX syndrome. Uh, so he came back hemizygous for missense mutation with a C767T to C mutation in exome 7, uh, which is in the leucine zipper. So we did end up sending his TREGs to Seattle, and he had a low expression of FOXP3, so he did not have normal FOXP3 expression. So what did we do with him? Uh, he was treated with high dose methylprednisolone uh, with gradual improvement in his diarrhea. However, he continued to be MPO and TPN dependent. He had some trials at feeds, um, but most of the time you'd try feeding him and he'd start pouring up diarrhea again. So didn't really tolerate that well. Tried NG feeds, which he didn't tolerate well. Um, so it was, he essentially was TPN dependent. Uh, we did try it. Tacrolimus uh, as a steroid sparing agent. And within days, his creatinine, uh, again in Canadian SI units, went from being about 10 to 100. Um, and he developed glucosuria, even though he did not have a high blood sugar. Um, so rapidly developed renal dysfunction. And as soon as we took him off the tacrolimus, that resolved. Uh, interestingly, it was not a nephrotic syndrome picture. Um, he also continued to have mild elevation of his liver enzymes and was very sensitive to liver toxic drugs. Um, for example, if you put him on fluconazole, his liver enzymes would go right up. Um, we also repeated his bone marrow as his counts uh, were not improving and his cellularity was 35% by this point. He's had some nuclear budding of erythroblasts and continued to have significantly decreased megakaryocytes with normal cytogenetics. Of course, uh, we worked him up for transplant, and thankfully his sister was a match. So uh, we collected marrow from her, and he had a reduced intensity conditioning regimen with alemtuzumab, triosulfan, and fludarabine. GVHD prophylaxis was MMF and steroids. We he was steroid dependent at that time, and with our experience with the tacrolimus, we were a bit concerned about putting him on a calcineur inhibitor. So decided to just go with the MMF and steroids initially, and if everything went well, uh, start the cyclosporin. And when he started the cyclosporin, uh, he actually did well. Um, he engrafted his neutrophils on day 10. However, he never really engrafted his platelets or red blood cells. So he continued to be transfusion dependent. His neutrophils then also started falling around two months post-transplant. And he was then requiring initially intermittent GCSF, but then he was requiring it regularly. 
bone marrow was repeated uh, on a few occasions uh, and he continued to require red cells, platelets, and GCSF, uh, and his marrow was hypocellular. We, unfortunately, we tried romeoplasty to try and get his platelets up, and that didn't help. Uh, and also, he, we did a trial of ortuzumib, uh, thinking that there was likely some sort of autoimmunity going on, and that did not help either. Uh, this is just uh, looking at uh, the course with his marrows. So one year post-transplant, his cellularity was 40%, and 15 months post-transplant, it was 5 to 10%. Chimerisms, uh, his T cells were a little bit slow to come in. Uh, by five months, his, his donor chimerism was 9%. However, by 16 months, it, they were up to 82%, which is actually quite a reasonable for chimerism. Um, his NK cells and myeloid were always 100%. Uh, he never really engrafted his B cells, so his chimerisms and B cells were not measurable. Um, as I mentioned, his T cells were quite slow to come in, and they didn't really normalize until he was around a year post-transplant. And that was one of the reasons why we waited on doing anything further with him is that we were hoping that he'd uh, grow some T rigs and that that would take care of his mineral failure. T cells never engrafted, so he remained on IVIG. Um, he had good NK cells from one month's post transplant on. Uh, and when he did get to a year with normal T cells, uh, we looked further at his T rigs, and these were normal at one year. And we were actually able to get our lab to sort out T rigs from the other T cells and do chimerisms on them. And his T rig chimerisms uh, mirrored his T cells and were 81% donor. So he should have had reasonable T rig numbers. However, by he, uh, other issues post transplant, um, he continued to have transaminitis. He had issues with line infections, poor wound healing, eczema. He had a few respiratory viruses, though, tolerated those well. Uh, he couldn't tolerate his steroid wean, uh, and he continued to be TPN dependent. Uh, he had intermittent trials of NG feeds, but those never went well. Um, he unfortunately had several episodes of anaphylaxis um, with very, very minimal exposures to things. Um, and he also, with the, the steroid dependence, uh, we decided to start him on sterolimus as a steroid spraying agent, and that actually went well. He had no renal complications. Um, and he was able to wean off of his steroids. So we did end up deciding to go ahead with the second transplant. Uh, we waited a good 18 months following his first, again, waiting to see if some of his T-rigs would come in and improve his marrow function. Uh, and uh, having talked to a number of different experts, um, everybody kind of said, hold off and wait a little bit and see if he turns around. Uh, but he never really did. So. For the second transplant, we decided to use a different donor. So he had a nine out of 10 mismatched unrelated donor, uh, peripheral stem cells this time with a really good stem cell dose. And uh, we increased his conditioning to more the Gungor protocol with Elmtuzumab, Bucell, Benef, and Darabine. Uh, GBHD prophylaxis with MMS and Sterolimus. Uh, we eventually switched him to Tacrolimus. And uh, this time around, he engrafted by day nine for neutrophils and his platelets came up, which I'm not sure who was happier, his family or the medical team. Uh, he continued to have line infections and poor wound healing until he immune constituted. And he did have issues with a C. diff infection. Um, but other than that, his second transplant was actually remarkably uncomplicated. So about 18 months post-transplant, his chimerisms are excellent. T cells are 97%. His myeloid B and NK cells are 100%. He's fully immune reconstituted with normal T cells, B cells, and K cells. He's making an immunoglobulin. He's off IVIG. He's had good vaccine responses to his diphtheria and tetanus. Uh, and uh, his gut is also improving. So he's been off TPN since a year post his second transplant. He's been off all immune suppression since about eight months post his second transplant. He's now eating normal food. His weight gain is good. He doesn't have any diarrhea. Uh, his food allergies are improving, but not completely resolved. Uh, he, however, still continues to have short stature with his height less than the third percentile. His weight has actually gotten up to the third percentile. He's continuing to have some eczema and psoriasis that's treated with topical steroids and protopic. And he's developmentally normal. The one thing I will mention is, uh, if you remember, there was that 11-year-old maternal cousin with eosinophilic esophagitis, and when we got more medical history on him, so the alarm bells were ringing off when the IPEX came back on this child, 
Um, so the cousin uh, did not actually have typical celiac disease. It was more an atypical presentation. Uh, he didn't have failure to thrive, but his weight was always on the low end. He also had quite chronic oral chelitis that was troublesome. He had mild to moderate eczema as well. So of course we screened him and he had the same mutation as his cousin. So he also had a matched sibling and went through transplant. Uh, he is also a one year post transplant. He's had hypothyroidism post transplant, um, still has issues with mild eczema, especially on his eyelids, but he had a very uncomplicated transplant. Um, we did uh, discuss a bit uh, whether or not he should go through transplant as he was a milder phenotype. Um, but in the end, we decided that probably the best thing for him was to go through transplant, particularly as he was good and looking at uh, long-term prognosis with IPEX, um, which I'll show some of the slides a little bit later, um, that it was good to get him before he developed anything significant. Um, the other piece was the family was moving to Turkey. So um, we were hoping to manage his IPEX before he moved away. I'll just review a little bit about IPEX syndrome. Uh, so this is immune dysregulation, uh, polyendocrinopathy, entropathy that's X-linked. Uh, the protein is in the T-cell receptor signaling pathway. Uh, I uh, put the cartoon in there, and that includes all the various different proteins that FOSB3 uh, potentially can affect. Uh, classic clinical manifestations are enteropathy, usually within the first months of life, and food allergies are also common, as we did see in our patients. Uh, they have endocrinopathy. Um, many of the patients will develop type 1 diabetes in the first months to years. Autoimmune thyroid disease is also common. Dermatitis is very common, uh, again, presenting usually in the first months of life. And this can include erythroderma, exfoliative dermatitis, psoriasis-like lesions, pemphigus nodularis is also reported. Uh, so these are just a couple of slides of some of the clinical manifestations. So at the top, uh, you can see your FOXP3 mutation affects your Tregs. And as a result, your effector T cells are not regulated properly, and you can develop autoimmunity against uh, things like your pancreas, your gut, your skin, and your kidney. And the second graph is looking at the frequency of the various different uh, organs uh, that can be affected by IPEX. The vast majority of patients, and uh, this is looking at the red bars, are uh, enteropathy. Most patients have skin disease. Endocrinopathy is very common. Interestingly, our patients do not have that. Um, hematological disease is quite common. Uh, however, it's generally autoimmune cytopenias, um, not so much marrow failure or uh, like lack of omega karyocytes, for example, like we saw her. Um, some patients will develop pulmonary complications. Uh, there's a few who've had cardiovascular issues, renal complications, uh, generally like glomerular nephritis or nephrotic type syndromes uh, can occur, uh, hepatic autoimmune disease, uh, lymphadenopathy, arthritis and vasculitis. Um, some patients do also have neurologic disease. And so there's also issues with serious infections, uh, though the thought is that the vast majority of patients likely have infections due to the amount of immune suppression they have, as well as breakdown in barriers, including the skin and gut. Looking at lab findings, some of them will have elevated IgE, sometimes also IgA. Eosinophilia, not surprisingly, is not uncommon. I mentioned the autoimmune cytopenias. Uh, they can develop autoantibodies against a multitude of things, including the pancreatic islet cells, thyroid, small bowel, and mucosa. And uh, you can see decreased FOXP3 positive Tregs by flow cytometry. Uh, and I've attached a graph at the top that shows, if you look at the different mutations that you can get in FOXP3, uh, what your average number of FOXP3 Tregs you can have. So not surprisingly, if you've got a deletion or frame shift, you're gonna have lower FOXP3 Tregs. Whereas if you have a misinterest mutation like you do in our patients, it can vary. Uh, and again, important to remember that if you're screening with flow cytometry, you can miss some disease, so it's always a good idea to go ahead with genetic testing if your clinical suspicion is high, even if your flow cytometry is normal. If you have a patient with FOXP3, uh, what are your management options? Um, so, uh, transplant is really your only cure, uh, and it's recommended uh, to do this early when there's no or mild organ impairment. 
uh, and that will result in improved resolution of autoimmunity. Um, early myeloablative conditioning resulted in high uh, transplant-related mortality, so uh, now most places are doing a reduced intensity regimen with these. There is some gene therapy protocols under development, but certainly not clinically available at this stage. If you've got a patient with autoimmunity, um, then T cell directed immune suppression, especially with Streptomyces uh, or Cassinern inhibitors, is recommended. Um, and some uh, suggest withholding immunizations to prevent immune activation, as that can often trigger autoimmunity. So, for example, in our patient, we did see that as soon as he got nanovirus infection, his enteropathy came recurring. Uh, an extreme presentation. And the graph at the top uh, is just showing uh, one of the studies that have looked at the efficacy of the various different immune suppressions in IPEX. And you can see the calcineurin inhibitors um, and rapamycin, for example, tend to have the most efficacy compared to some of the other agents. So this is looking at prognosis in IPEX. Uh, the first graph is divided up by the various different types of mutations. So frame shift, uh, deletions, emissense mutations, there's polyadenylation mutations as well. Uh, so our patient would have been a emissense mutation, uh, which uh, their survival curve is sort of in the middle there. Um, and if you look at transplant, uh, or if you look at survival by whether or not the patient has had transplant in IPEX, um, if you do not transplant them, overall survival at 10 to 20 years is around 50% and closer to 75% over 10 to 20 years uh, following transplant. So a couple of questions uh, from this case uh, that I still haven't figured out. Um, so he really did seem to present with more a plastic anemia bone marrow failure type presentation as opposed to autoimmune cytopenias. Uh, which I haven't seen any reports in IPEX. Uh, looking at the literature, there was one case of pure red cell aphasia. Um, there's been a couple of studies looking at autoantibodies um, that can be produced, and so some of them are potentially narrow autoantibodies, uh, but I haven't actually seen a patient reported with that presentation. Uh, the other thing I haven't figured out either is uh, his short stature. So I've attached a graph of his weight and height uh, on slides. Um, I think one of the challenges with his management has been as soon as he got the enteritis, everybody brushed off his failure to thrive and short stature as being extremely ill. But he was a very healthy kid other than and uh, low platelets uh, when he walked in the door when I first saw him but his height has always been less than the third percentile. So if anybody has any thoughts on uh, what might be the cause of that, um, I would be quite interested to hear. Uh, we did recently do a bone age on him and it is actually normal. Um, his parents are about average height, so uh, I haven't quite sorted out why he continues to be short stature and he also hasn't shown significant catch up growth since being off steroids. So I will leave it at that for any questions or comments. So uh, Luciano, did height improve after transplant? So no, his, um, these growth curves are actually uh, current um, and he's 18 months post transplant. So um, his, trans his second transplant was done uh, right around three years of age. Um, and yes, the question about nutritional deficiencies is um, a good one. Um, he's had very significant assessment of his nutrition because he was CPN dependent for so long. And our GI program here measures all of the micronutrients. He did have a bit of so haven't been able to find that and his current diet is quite normal um, he's quite a meat eating pasta -y kind of guy um, but despite that hasn't had significant improvement um, and then the other questions have been endocrine um, i have sent another referral for them to look at this um, and pituitary abnormalities um, i believe he's had an mri of his head but i'll have to confirm um, he has not had a lot of growth hormone testing or anything like that. Um, 
again, I have had issues with the teams here, especially when he was so sick, just attributing it to his um, being so unwell. Um, and it's been a little bit uh, challenging, especially when he was really unwell for people to, to pick it up the, the investigations of his short stature, but now he's been off steroids for so long, I'm hoping endocrine will uh, look a little bit more thoroughly and look at his growth hormone. Um, and then the other question was, if we looked at exome results specifically for hits related to short stature. Um, that's actually a good uh, question um, and we could get the data reanalyzed. Um, the other question was no TBI and no, we didn't do TBI. He was CAMPATH trio flu and CAMPATH bu flu for both of his conditioning. So definitely some good suggestions. Perhaps we will find out. I do wonder if he ever made antibodies against his growth hormone. Any other comments? I don't think there is any other comments, so we can probably move on to our paper article review, which I think goes back to Jen. Okay, so uh, we are going to present an article from Blood um, looking at CD137 deficiency, which has been shown to cause immune dysregulation and predisposition to lymph, lymph I can't even say this, lymphomogenesis. Um, and this was published just in 2019 recently. So the defect. So this is the deficiency of the TNF receptor superfamily member 9, and that's the gene that you can see on the right-hand side there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. I'm just going to go straight into kind of the clinical phenotype of this because I think that's probably of most interest to everyone. So they actually had um, four, four kids with this immune deficiency, and this was a study that was done, it looks like in collaboration with a group in Vienna, uh, Turkey, um, Palestine, and various other um, countries to kind of put this all together. Um, the first child, um, so these are patients that are homozygous mutations in this gene, and the parents were all, all heterozygous. Uh, patient number one was a Turkish Turkish uh, male, I believe, who was um, born to consanguineous parents. He had Burkitt's lymphoma at the age of two, uh, recurrent ear infections, hepatosplenomegaly, hypogammaglobulinemia. Uh, there was no family history. I guess the parents were first degree cousins um, and, uh, and recovered well from the lymphoma. I'm going to pop back and forth between this first and next slide because it kind of continues. Um, so they, this just outlines the chemo that he received as part of that and, and outcome has, has responded well, currently just receiving IVIG and antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. The second uh, patient was also born to parents who were consanguineous first degree cousins um, of Palestinian uh, heritage. He, or she, I'm not actually sure which, um, that patient presented with an Alps-like uh, disorder around the age of six, uh, characterized by hepatosplenomegaly, uh, lymphadenopathy, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, ITP, uh, and also uh, and uh, EBV positive lymphoproliferative disorder. I know they also mentioned here some recurrent pneumonias as well, and uh, and but no history of malignancy. Managed on some cellcept and antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, the third child, again born to third uh, consanguineous parents who were third degree cousins of Turkish descent. Um, had problems with hepatic infections, pneumonias, otitis, atop dermatitis, hypogammaglobulinemia, developed a Hodgkin's lymphoma at the age of 10 that was EBV positive um, and uh, treated, of course, with uh, atopside doxo and vincristine. This patient was also no noted to have short stature and currently maintained on IVIG and antibiotic prophylaxis. And then the fourth uh, from this cohort was actually diagnosed quite a bit later. Initial uh, clinical manifestations were at eight, but my impression was the diagnosis wasn't made until around the age of 33. Um, Non-consanguinity, um, but uh, from, from Colombia, and uh, this patient had otitis media and sinusitis starting at the age of eight, and then hypogammaglobulinemia with pneumonias not starting until the 20s, and also EBV positive. Um, and currently on immunoglobulin replacement. The other two columns here are patients that were uh, apparently reported in a different paper, so I won't go into those uh, in detail right now. 
Um, so the results of the testing, this, they show the pedigrees here. So they did whole exome sequencing and functional testing, showing homozygous mutations in TNF-RSF9. Um, three patients also had a sibling who was also homozygous but asymptomatic, which is interesting. And uh, there was reduced expression of CD137 on activated VT and NK cells, consistent with a loss of function phenotype. Uh, CD137 ligand expression on T cells was maintained. And they did note that in the asymptomatic siblings, uh, the expression of uh, CD137 was also reduced or abrogated. From an immunophenotype point of view, uh, there were actually increased transitional and immature B cells, reduced memory B cells, and plasma blasts. Uh, two patients had low IgG, one had low IgM, and two had low IgA. Uh, two actually had high IgA and IgM. Three patients had reduced follicular helper T cells, and two had reduced NK cells. And I'll turn it over to Nikki for the remainder. So I'm going to review some of the functional defects that were found in these patients. Uh, so first of all, the functional T cell defects. Uh, so you can see in the graph on the right-hand side that there was reduced proliferation and activation to anti-CD3. So uh, the healthy donor is the one on the left, uh, followed by the three patients. Uh, the very bottom is the unstimulated. Uh, you can see in the next one up, uh, stimulation with anti-CD3 um, showed very reduced proliferation in our patients. If you added in um, CD137 ligand, um, there was really not much improvement, um, maybe marginal. Uh, however, adding in OX40 or CD28 did show some improvement. So uh, the hypothesis is that uh, the CD137 and CD137 ligand interaction is actually quite in, uh, in T cells. And if you add an anti-CD28 or OX40 post-stimulation, you can see some improvement. Um, I'm not going to show the graph, um, but the they, uh, the group also blocked CD137 expression in healthy purple blood cells and showed a dose dependent reduction in proliferation with anti CD. Um, they also showed that there was a lack of CD137 post stimulation um, that can be compensated by other post stimulators. Uh, they found T rays were reduced and your CTL and NK function were also reduced, and in particular, EBD specific CTL toxicity. Um, degranulation, however, was intact as were downstream TCR signaling pathway. Uh, to prove causation, uh, they created a CD137 vector and added it into patient three. And in the graph on the bottom left, you can see in the red bar uh, that with the CD137 vector, you had appropriate expression and activation of T cells. Um, and finally, on the bottom right uh, are very pretty pictures looking at the TCR repertoire and you can see that the repertoire in all these patients uh, was significantly reduced. So looking at the B cells, uh, they did find that B cell activation was decreased, uh, which you can see on the graphs on the left hand side, uh, both in patient two and three, so a healthy donor on the left followed by the two patients. Uh, so stimulation with CD40 ligand and IL-4 did not result in much stimulation. Uh, and class switch recombination was also reduced, uh, as shown in the graphs in the middle. And finally, B-cell proliferation was also significantly reduced, as shown on the right-hand side. Uh, so uh, it was thought that CD137 is required for proper activation and maturation of B-cells. And if you do not have CD137, you result in a humoral abnormal response, uh, which could be related to a lack of CD137 signaling in T follicular helper cells uh, uh, that may be causing some of the problems. So uh, the next slide is a very lovely cartoon summarizing the paper. So uh, as Jen described, the four families uh, with the mosaicus mutations had recurrent infections, they were susceptible to herpes family viruses and EVD associated lymphoma predisposition. And in the graph at the top, you can see that if there's a CD137 mutation, uh, then there's issues with activation, proliferation, 
uh, decreased T cell repertoire and CTL site toxicity in the T cells and in B cells for class switching and memory formation. Uh, there was some discussion that CD137 uh, may be a potential good target for immunotherapy for autoimmunity and malignancy. It could potentially act as an immune suppressor, enhancing T-rate expansion or ameliorating TH17 autoimmune effects. Uh, it may be a potential drug target uh, for immune stimulation or modulating the tumor molecular environment and enhancing T and NK cell cytotoxicity. And there are actually some CD137 agonistic monoclonal antibodies in clinical trials. So in summary, this was a description of a novel germline mutation in TNFRSF9. Uh, and one of the questions uh, that they were also left with was whether or not uh, CD28 potentially would help these patients, uh, though clearly there's not very many of them described. So uh, an interesting mutation to think about in patients presenting with these symptoms and uh, also to think about CD20 therapy if uh, any of them are diagnosed. So any questions or comments? Just anything, and if not, thank you to everyone for participating in the webinar. Uh, and uh, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to contact Jen or I. Um, we'd be Happy for any suggestions on our patients and also uh, any comments or uh, feedback.